Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and support our new movement by putting Let's Go Viral in the comment section. But if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to give us a five-star rating and a nice review. But without further ado, here are your hosts, Nicely Chunk of Benny and Greg King. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast, members of the Off The Ball Network. And today's topic of discussion, I want to be breaking down who I think will be having the most chance of coming out of the Eastern Conference come this postseason. But before we get started with today's episode, if you're new to our YouTube channel or listening on Apple Podcasts, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and turn on post notifications and sub to the YouTube channel. That being said, let's talk about the top six teams and contenders here in the respected conference of the Eastern Conference that have a tremendous shot of making it to the NBA Finals, let alone winning the whole damn thing this season. I want to start off with the Miami Heat because Miami is one of the toughest and deepest teams in the entire league. You know, they have a six man of the year candidate in Tyler Hero. They have a defensive player in the year candidate in Bam Adebayo had he played, you know, a little bit more games. And they have an MVP caliber player in Jimmy Butler, who I think, you know, is um, not necessarily regarded as a superstar player, but you know, he is a pretty high level all-star to a certain degree if you ask most people. That being said, they're also well coached. And this is a team that already knows exactly what it takes to make it to the NBA Finals. Now, when it comes to winning it, they might not have the you know blueprint to that so to speak but just looking at this new revamped roster the acquisition of victor oladipo at the start of the season was really tremendous for them you know i think with miami being a dribble handoff based offense that you know includes a lot of shooting around it and you know you having one to two decision makers on the floor and either a tyler hero a kyle lowry or a jimmy butler i think they lack a little bit of individual creation when it comes to, you know, the guys here on this roster. And I think that's when Victor Oladipo is going to show his value from that standpoint, because he's shown the ability to be able to be a three-level scorer. The long ball probably isn't something that, you know, he's that prolific with at this stage of his career, but, you know, he has shown the ability to be adequate enough to, you know, keep the defense honest from that perspective. My biggest issue with Miami, though, is probably, although they are one of the better defensive teams in the entire league, I think come this postseason, their lack of size is going to be a little bit more apparent when you're going up against teams that feature a Joel Embiid, uh, a Kevin Durant, a Ben Simmons, and an Andre Drummond type of lineup. You know, also the Milwaukee Bucks that have Giannis and Tantacupo and Brooke Lopez at the helm of, you know, their front court. I think Miami could find themselves in a little bit of a heap of a trouble when it comes to, you know, trying to defend those type of guys. Not to mention, you could be putting Bam at a bio in a really tough predicament, just given, you know, he's probably the only guy outside of Ermer, Omir Yurt7, who can really provide you interior defense from that perspective. Dwayne Dedman's good, but more than likely, I think a guy like Joel Embiid and Giannis Antetokounmpo certainly can get him in foul trouble, and you could be a little bit limited defensively with your back line from that perspective. Not to mention, I think offensively, there is some things to be optimistic about when you're looking at the Miami Heat. They're led by a championship level point guard in Kyle Lowry. You also just got another additional wing defender in Tucker, and you saw what he was able to do come postseason for the Milwaukee Bucks last year as they went on to win the NBA championship. And PJ Tucker's defensive capabilities played a tremendous role in them accomplishing that feat. That being said, Miami is probably one of those teams that has a pretty good shot of losing in the first round, and it's not necessarily their fault. It's only because they're going to have an unfortunate luck of the draw more than likely if they run into a team like the Brooklyn Nets. I, in my opinion, personally trust Brooklyn a little bit more at this um, point, point just because they have some of those things that you know you're kind of looking for in the championship level team and i'll talk about those things a little bit later on but let's move on from miami and let's talk about chicago here as of right now because of the bulls to start out the year, I was really optimistic about them. I thought the acquisition of Lonzo Ball, DeMar DeRozan, and trading for Nikola Vucevic at the previous trade deadline the year before were all some co- key components as to why I thought they were going to have um, you know, a really tremendous regular season and could be a dark horse heading into the postseason this year. But this is a team that's just been bitten by the injury bug you know they've had guys in and out of the lineup all season we haven't seen Lonzo Ball since January 20th um Alex Caruso has been in and out with that wrist injury and guys like Nikola Vucevic and Zach Levine have also missed some time here as well 
when it comes to Chicago, I do believe that Chicago has a lot of deficiencies. I just don't believe that Chicago's offense is built for the postseason. And what I mean by that is, I think out of all the contending teams in the Eastern Conference, Chicago is probably the team that you have the best chance of game planning for and being able to limit them offensively. Because it's, it's quite apparent when you look at their starting lineup, having Nikola Vucevic, Alonzo Ball when he's healthy, Zach Levine and DeMar DeRozan, those are all capable guys that are gonna be able to give you some production. But Zach Levine, teams are gonna probably try to load up against him for setting. And DeMar DeRozan, he's gonna be a guy that, you know, teams are gonna emphasize, you know, picking him up of the free throw line and, you know, just trying to negate some of those mid-range jump shots. I think that that's something that, you know, the Bulls should bring some level of concern with. And they just, they do not, the, Chicago does not have enough offensive firepower, in my opinion, to be able to sustain the things that they can do defensively, although they're one of the better defensive teams in the entire NBA. And with Lonzo Ball and Alex Caruso coming back, two of your best point of attack defenders on your entire roster, if they're not able to accumulate turnovers, because Chicago runs a turnover-based defense, if they're not able to accumulate turnovers and you know turn those into transition points, it's going to be a really tough feat for them to really be able to make it deep into the postseason. Now, I do believe that there is some level of optimism about them having a lot of floor spacers, guys that can, you know, knock down shots from the perimeter. And that's obviously been a, a big reason as to why DeMar DeRozan's been playing his level of basketball so far this season. But I do believe that Chicago, they have guys who can score in spaces, but they don't have enough guys who can score in traffic. And I think come postseason, you're going to have to have some counters offensively in order for you to to keep your heads above water now granted this is also a team that is a little bit inexperienced you know Vucevic has a little bit of postseason experience um DeMar DeRozan you know he was a second round exit essentially routinely in Toronto and Zach Levine has no playoff experience as well so I think when it, when you look at that type of thing that could also bring you some level of concern as well not to mention Chicago at times they don't look like they have enough championship habits and I think also you know Tristan Thompson although he is an adequate acquisition that they made here at the trade deadline he's not going to be able to give enough pushback to some of the prominent bigs that the Eastern Conference has to offer come this postseason but I do think that you know Chicago can make some of these series fun um, but in the event that they go up against a team that has two prominent offensive wings um, that can score the ball at an extremely high rate like a Jason Tatum and a Jalen Brown I think their team could struggle from that perspective and not to mention those interior guys that could also give them some a heap of trouble as well so Chicago is one of those teams that we have to be a little bit worrisome about and I think those X factors for them are going to be Ayo Dunsumu and Kobe White but we'll just have to see what they have to offer come postseason next team I want to talk about is the Boston Celtics um Boston uh, at the time of this recording they are 23 and 6 since January 7th and you know Boston being the best defensive team in the entire NBA a large part of that has to do with you know Ime Uduku finally being able to get the right guys here in place you know they brought back Daniel Tice Al Horford was also a piece that they brought back at the beginning of this season negating and getting away to, uh, from Dennis Schroeder a guy who you know wasn't able to really maximize as an off-ball player um, in the event that Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are handling the basketball but all that being said you know Boston is one of those teams that hangs their hats on the defensive end like a lot of these teams here on today's list and the triple switch defense that they've been able to implement being able to protect their smaller guards and just weaponize the rest of their defenders guys like Robert Williams who's able to play off ball defensively and maximize his ability as a rim protector because he has Al Horford as a pick and roll defender a guy who can switch on onto smaller guards and be able to hold his own um, these guys have a lot of ground coverage as well you know they, especially Robert Williams you know he's really great and adequate as a defender from that perspective but offensively what's really been able to help um, Boston Celtics team have uh, some level of success has to do with Jason Tatum elevating his level of play as a playmaker you know he's making a lot more quicker reads he's not holding the basketball as much in a just not allowing the defense to stay stagnant movement has been tremendous and I give credit to Marcus Smart for you know kind of getting on to his guys about you know the ball sticking and not running a fluid enough based offense I think you know with, with Jay Jason Tatum elevating his level of play as a playmaker being able to you know make reads out of the mid post top of the key and pick and roll scenarios I'm um, just playing really methodically he's really been able to you know open things up for Boston and I think that you know in the event that you know their, their bench can give them a little bit more offense because they don't have one of the better benches in the entire league i think that 
Boston can have a really good shot of coming out of the Eastern Conference, especially since everybody now understands their roles. You have guys like Grant Williams who can defend and knock down corner threes. Marcus Smart has shown the ability to you know space the floor out for you and catch and shoot scenarios, especially when he's not you know trying to play the role of a natural point guard and you know just kind of put himself in positions where he can be a traditional off guard. I think, you know, the, there's a lot of optimism here in Boston about these guys, you know, potentially finding themselves in the Eastern Conference Finals. On to the Philadelphia 76ers. We know about the moves that they made here at the trade deadline, acquiring James Harden, one of the better isolation scorers in the entire league. And when you look at what Philadelphia had to offer before the trade deadline, you had a nice balance, it seemed like, of uh, guys who could get their own shot, shot create, be handlers on the perimeter and pick and roll scenarios um you also had some interior presence with joel and beat and a backup center and andre drummond who's having a really good season off the bench and you know it gave you a little bit of optimism about being able to sustain leads as well but they no longer have those key assets in seth curry and andre drummond now james harden is going to be at the helm of your offense alongside joel and bead i do have some concerns when it comes to philadelphia's offense as well all of it is going to fall on James Harden because if he gets into a situation where he's just emphasizing this two-man game with Joel Embiid, in the event of that, you know, you're kind of shutting out the rest of these guys and you're making sure, and you're not doing the best of the job of making sure that Tobias Harris gets his certain amount of shots per game, Tyrese Maxey is staying hot and things of that nature, and you're also making sure that you're getting guys, those off-ball guys like George and Yang involved. I think there could be some concerns there if you're the Philadelphia 76ers. And I think we saw that get put on display the other night against the Brooklyn Nets when they got blown out at home and you can tell that you know Philadelphia they just they're one of those offenses that obviously does not rely too heavily on the three-point shot but I think you know when you had Seth Curry a guy who could space the floor out for you and Denny Green's out there on the floor with you uh, alongside the Tyrese Maxey it, it, you could get away with you know being a mid-range oriented team because you had enough floor spaces but I think when in the event that you have a lineup that features Tobias Harris, Matisse Thybul, a Joel Embiid. There could be some concerns about this team just not emphasizing, you know, enough three-pointers to really keep the defense honest and making sure that their offense is spread out offensively enough for them to be able to, you know, just capitalize in a half-court setting. Not to mention Joel Embiid, he's a guy that tends to, you know, obviously we understand he's going to get to the free throw line this postseason. Um, it probably won't be at the volume that he's been able to do it here as of late, but I do think that, you know, some, uh, some of these officials are going to try to give him the benefit of the doubt because he's really hard to uh, officiate just because of, you know, all the contact that you know he he obtains and he's just this physically imposing player those guys are always tough to kind of officiate doc rivers we also have to you know kind of look at him as a coach you know the lack of adjustments come postseason has definitely been something that put on blast about not to mention i think when it comes to you know this philadelphia team they're kind of forced to be in this position where you know they're forced to run a spread offense with a bunch of mid-range jump shooters because you have James Harden, a guy who typically is known for optimizing his ability to play offensively by being somebody who can be not only an isolation scorer, but a facilitator who can kick out to shooters, hit the roll man and on lob opportunities and picket passes. And in the event that you play with a Joel Embiid, you're also going to be able to utilize him in some pick and pop scenarios as well. My question for Doc Rivers, are you, how are you going to be able to not allow opposing defenses to exploit Matisse Thybul's lack of off-ball shooting? Because that's definitely going to bring some a high level of concern. And then I also think that, you know, with this team being so prominent as mid-range shooters and not being that comfortable shooting the long ball outside, because you can tell Tobias Harris does not feel that comfortable being a floor spacer. And he'd much rather get to his one to two dribble pull up which he's a lot more proficient at it's going to bring some level of concern right you know philadelphia is one of those teams that likes to score in the elbow areas free throw line area and towards the charity stripe and the short corners and getting to the rim and things of that nature that's how they like to score the basketball and since you have james harden on your roster now you're kind of putting a predicament where you're going to have to change that a little bit and you know kind of tweak your offense to a certain degree and i think that could be exploited just because they don't have enough floor spacers and now they lost their depth losing out on guys like seth curry and andre drummond here at the trade deadline but going to the following team i want to talk about the brooklyn nets brooklyn despite them being a lower seed this year and more than likely going to be a step for a seed I still have a lot of optimism about them making it to the conference finals. I think, you know, come to the postseason, especially in the event that, you know, this team doesn't have home court advantage and, you know, with them not having Kyrie Irving available for home games, 
they are going to probably prefer to play more road games. And with that being said, I would much rather have Kyrie Irving for four games rather than three games on the road if I'm the Brooklyn Nets. And I think Sean Marks and them, you know, understand that. And, you know, with all that being said, you know, Brooklyn is one of those teams that obviously has done a really good job in terms, you know, just putting together a championship level roster. From top to bottom, this looks like, you know, they have the ability to, you know, really look like a championship level team. You know, you have your two stars in Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving who can get their own shot and have the ability to, you know, play make a little bit if needed. You have your defensive back line. LaMarcus Aldridge can provide some size, although he's not that great as a defender. Think along a guy like Ben Simmons who's gonna you know be able to provide some rim protection he's also gonna have the toughest matchup uh, for you on a nightly basis so that takes pressure off of Kevin Durant having to be the defensive anchor and I look forward to Ben Simmons being the defensive anchor of this Brooklyn Nets team because he hasn't really had the opportunity to really showcase his ability to do that while playing in Philadelphia because Joel Embiid played that role at the center position but now you know I think it'll be interesting kind of seeing Ben Simmons communicate as a backline defender just kind of make sure that you know everybody's in the right positions defensively and what i've noticed about the nets over these last couple of postseasons is that despite you know any deficiencies that they may have on the defensive end when it comes to defending in clutch scenarios and just you know coming into big games with a lot at stake this is a team that will showcase to you the ability for them to be able to lock down defenders on a nightly basis and i think that you know is definitely going to bring them a lot of optimism and what i also like about brooklyn outside of just the roster is their ability to be able to adapt. I think this is a team that has the ability to play big and small. And you know, in the event that you go up against the Milwaukee Bucks in a conference finals, you know, you're gonna have to be able to be that interchangeable uh, offensively and defensively. And Brooklyn, given the roster, has the ability to do that. Um, I have a little bit of questions all about how Ben Simmons is gonna be used offensively. I sure hope that Steve Nash doesn't try to limit him and kind of minimize his play, just putting him in the dunker spot. I hope they can, you know, you Utilize him as a screener and you know maybe kind of utilize him as a bam and a bio like Demontis Sabonis allowing him you know do some dribble handoff stuff at the top of the key the long elbows and things of that nature and you know just make some fake handoffs and make a place for himself offensively that way especially you know because th there's a lot more added spacing so he's not going to be scared to score the basketball he's going to be a lot more comfortable with that stuff being said and you know I just think there's a lot of optimism right there and I think the only team that has the opportunity to really match up with the Brooklyn Nets from a just a match a pure matchup standpoint probably the Milwaukee Bucks Milwaukee is one of those teams that's going to run that spread offense they have a lot of floor spaces a lot of three and D guys you know a lot of guys that are just capable of being able to shoot the basketball and defend at an extremely high level and with them being the defending champions they already know exactly what it takes to you know get back to the promised land and win it all again and I think this season with them going such, through such a tough Eastern Conference um you know they've shown some struggles here as of late to a certain degree but I think just looking at the roster that Milwaukee has you know they have the ideal roster for any championship level team uh, facilitator and Drew Holiday who can also defend at a high level is a two-way guy and he's shooting a career high from beyond the arc sub 40 percent not to mention also giving you 1.5 steals per game and then when you're looking at Chris Middleton their closer a guy who can you know operate in the pick and roll can play make to a certain degree as well and he's really elevated that part of his game offensively and that's really shown here in the last couple of seasons here in Milwaukee I think they have that to hang their hat on and not to mention having the MVP caliber player in Giannis and Tantacupo who can also play the, the other side of the basketball as well and with Brooke Lopez coming back he can play his traditional off-ball defensive role as a help side and team defender, maximizing his rim protection and just uh, taking advantage of Brook Lopez just sagging off of defenders and playing drop coverage. Because one thing we know about this Milwaukee Bucks defense is they are going to negate everything at the rim. They're going to force you to shoot a lot of tough mid-range jump shots to make you uncomfortable from that perspective. And on top of that, they are not going to, they're just going to force you to beat them by shooting the long ball. And given since come the postseason, three-point percentage typically tends to drop i think that they have a great defensive scheme and they have enough offensive players and guys that can you know capitalize offensively for them to really be able to get back to the promised land let alone repeat and i think when you tie all that stuff into consideration i think milwaukee is probably the best team to put your money on in terms of coming out of the eastern conference but hey let me know what you guys think about this here in the comment section who do you guys have coming out of the eastern conference 
Thank you guys so much for tuning into another episode with me here on the Ball Fake Podcast. If you're new to our YouTube channel or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to give us a five star rating, like, comment, and subscribe. Turn on post notifications and give us a nice little review. But besides that, it's your boy, Nicey Chunger Vinny. You're listening to the Ball Fake Podcast, and we out.